Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four Four generations. The stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Hey everybody, welcome in, let's get it done. It's another stud cast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. I'm David Summers, and here comes the story of wrestling in America as told by the stud, whose family started the profession 100 years ago. So now, let's get back into the ring, back into time as we get wall-to-wall, treetop tall, with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller, in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. All right, stud, are you full of football? Do you, you think you can hold a few more games? Oh, geez, man, we're about down to a few more. That's about it, right? <laughs> ah, hey, There's going to be some championship games, though. That'll be good. Yeah, you know? yeah I think it's going to be really interesting. And, of course, the committee, the great committee, is trying to plan everything out and see see who gets a pass to the big dance and – you know, Alabama, I think Alabama fans are just grateful to be where we are and in the coming championship game this coming Saturday against Georgia. And so, uh, listen, I ain't pulling against Georgia. And I got a lot of friends in Georgia who say, oh, we're not going to pull against Alabama either. So, anyway, I think it's a lot of fun, and uh, regardless of what happens. Yeah, great time of year, man. Really is. All right, listen, Stud, last week's Stud Cast, number 326. This is number 327, by the way. Last week's finished with the month of November 1979. You were the only one of five partners still in Knoxville preparing to move to Pensacola, Florida. Bob Armstrong, your brother Robert, and cousins Jimmy Golden and Roy Lee Welch, they were already in Pensacola, home of Southeastern Gulf Coast Territory. They had just finished a week that had seen the attendance drop after that huge Thanksgiving week of the week before, right? That's correct. I think that's right, Dave. And uh, after the Thanksgiving week, in almost every territory in the country, there was going to be a huge drop in attendance. And it wasn't uncommon for the next four weeks to see fewer fans until the the week uh, beginning on Christmas Day. That week again, starting with Christmas Day, you got a big, uh, big boost in your audience again all of a sudden. So my partners and I had an extremely important meeting in that last uh, cast, and uh, they that that had all five of us for the first time in almost two years on the phone with each other, talking about business, uh, and it was a uh, it was a good thing that uh, we had that opportunity. I was closing my books in Knoxville on uh, on the uh, organizing, and then I was basically starting to organize the future of the Southeastern Gulf Coast books. So 1979, wow, had been a tumultuous year, by far the most difficult in my 18 year wrestling career. No doubt about that. I came close several times to leaving the business entirely, but thankfully I hung in there. And with this conference call meeting that we had, I began to feel better about the prospects of 1980. Gotcha. Okay, so I thought last week's Stuckcast was filled with hope, hope for a better year in both southeastern both southeastern territories in 1980. So also maybe some hope that would never encounter another wrestling war, at least on your behalf. Hope for expansion of the southeastern Gulf Coast territory, which I'm pretty sure is what you were pushing for. And of course, with the possible addition of Birmingham, Alabama. So hope was even in last week's learning tree question that Jim Barnett would have success in Knoxville, not only for himself, but for all the great fans there. So, 
you mentioned a lot of hope there, Dave. You yes. know, a, yeah. a lot of hope for the future, man, for not just us, but for uh, the Georgia Territory, too. And uh, from last week's stud test, and, and I want to briefly go back to that learning tree question you just mentioned last week. And, uh, and I kind of want to start this uh, stud cast a little bit different way than normal. So uh, I want to let's take a deep dive into the year of 1979 when all of America, man, was searching for hope <laughs> for the future. And uh, so <laughs> there were so many comparisons. Uh, uh, and there are so many comparisons to be made from what was happening in our country today with what was happening in America in 1979. So I want to talk about some real American history today. I want to point out, in my opinion, some of the many similarities between 1979 and now, especially for those listeners who weren't here in 1979. And we got a lot of those out there, Dave, that listen to us that might not have been around in 1979. So uh, it has uh, recently fascinated me to see some of the crazy world events. And, and I want to spend a little time today talking about how things in America in 1979 were adversely affecting everything, man, seemed like, hmm. even professional wrestling. Wow. Okay. That's, that would be interesting, Ron. I, I mean, I've got maybe a little bit of an idea of how a particular year, like 40 years ago, could compare to events of today. So, all right. So where, where else are we writing today? Well, we're going to take a look at the first week in December of that extremely difficult 1979 year. The matches we'll talk about are going to be in Mobile, Alabama. We're going to focus on those. Also on the TV show, which is, again, loaded with talent and angles, TV clips from Tennessee, and a very unusual 20-man tug of war on the outside of the WTVY Dothan TV station <laughs> that produced all the Southeastern TV shows. Wow. So uh, we'll give everyone the results of the card as we usually do, and the attendances for all three of the major markets. And by golly, we got enough time, man. We're going to do us another learning tree. <laughs> all right. So you really have a lot you want to get into on this one. Maybe you have a lot of hope on this one too, Stud. All right. So it sounds like we're going to begin it with a little history lesson. I was less than 20 years old in 1979. So tell us how that particular year, 79, it was a pivotal year for me too, more so than others maybe, com how it compares for you today and even affected professional wrestling. Well, it actually all began, man, a couple of years before 1979, around 1977, things started changing in the country. And the first thing that affected wrestling fans was inflation. The country was experiencing some of the worst inflation in its history in the 1970s, late 1970s. Uh, prices on everything were suddenly skyrocketing, skyrocketing, and inflation dug deep into every American's pocket, especially, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the wrestling fans. And, uh, and I had, you know, very, I've been very lucky to have fared a lot better than most territories in the late 1970s. A lot of them suffered through the late the late seventies, and comparing that to today, for the last couple of years, we have experienced close to that same level of inflation. It's in our country today. It's back again, right? Worst inflation <laughs> basically since the late nineteen seventies, for sure. So back in the late nineteen seventies, not only did you have inflation problem, but you had in, an interest rate problem on all the loans for everything. That uh, we were getting, uh, you know, uh, and, and they, they were at all time highs. Home and car payments were eating away at the money fans mm. had for their wrestling, and that limited their participation, obviously. And, uh, you know, where are the loan rates now, Dave? <laughs> uh, you're right. I mean, the highest I can even re ever remember maybe would be around 8%. Yeah. So, you know, back in the late 70s, we had a problem also with a country called Iran. <laughs> and they had taken over our American embassy in Tehran, yep. nailed our American citizens hostage for almost a year and a half. And uh, does that sound for a little bit, a little familiar, Dave, about anything that's happening now? It sounds like the same world is continuing to spin. It certainly does, Ron. So hostages in that part of the world 
are big news today. So I see your point about all of this and agree with everything you've said. But exactly how does this, talking about wrestling in the late 1970s, how does all this tie into our studcast today? Well, you know, because all these bad things were about to end, and Dave, and the end of 1979 was not only the end of my problems, but just about all Americans everywhere. 1980 brought a bright future, man. Uh, the end of inflation, the end of these extremely high interest rates, the end of the Iran hostage problem. And for wrestling fans, it brought the beginning of cable and satellite TV. It brought the greatest generation of wrestlers ever, I think. Uh, it brought more money in fans' pockets and uh, what I believe was the greatest six or seven years in the sport's history. So we at Southeastern exploded the interest in the sport in the early 1980s. And then we, at, at, at about, by 1985, we took it to an extremely high level. Uh, we, we went from Southeastern, turned into Continental Championship Wrestling. Uh, interest in wrestling all over the world was on fire during those 80s. And I think it was the sport's finest hour. <laughs> I think so, too. That is crazy. I had no idea that this was happening in my area. Uh, it was happening. What was happening here was happening really all over the world. So now I see. And when I was younger, I just wasn't thinking about that kind of stuff in 1979. But was the, was the end of the era, not just for you and your company, but really everywhere. And why 1980 really was a turning point. It really lit the sport up. Quite an interesting story, a, a short history lesson right there, Stud. So are you ready to tell us what the card was? Let's go to Mobile, Alabama, Wednesday, December 5th, 1979. Yeah, let's take you there, man. And, uh, and wow, what a very good card this one was, man. It was a triple main event. The opening match was with the wrestling pro returning to Mobile to face Roy Lee Welch. After this super pro showing up a week earlier from out of nowhere, it kind of challenged him. So, you know, wrestling pro wanted to get involved, and uh, so we put him on there. He was such a great wrestler and a big star and a big name there. Joe Lou Duke was going to be in his first Southeastern handicap match against two opponents. He'd always been sp facing one, but uh, we had him do that for a while up there in Tennessee with two, so we started putting him in the ring with two guys. Then he was going to be facing to Troy Graham, and he was going to be facing that new super pro that I'd uh, mouthed off and, and uh, kind of made the, the wrestling pro mad. So the next match was going to be a return match. This time it was going to be without the boxing gloves, and it was going to be a no disqualification, and it was going to be Rob again against Jimmy Golden. Then Tony Charles, uh, after being back in southeastern Gulf Coast for only two weeks, had lost his United States junior heavyweight belt to Norvell Austin in the first week he was back, and he was going to be getting his second opportunity to win it back, and that match was also going to be a no disqualification match. Then there was the Southeastern Tag Championship on the line again. This time the match was going to end that long-running feud at this point between Kevin Sullivan and Jerry Stubbs uh, against the champion Mongolians managed by the great Mephisto. Mm. And uh, the wrestler who lost the fall uh, and the match, basically, the match, you lost, it's also every what's single fall matches. So the wrestler who lost the fall was also going to have to leave Southeastern. Mm. Then for the third main event, uh, going to be Bob Armstrong for the Southeastern Championship belt. He was going to be defending against a Mongolian stomper. I think you're exactly right. Three main events. That is a really strong card. Three championship matches. One with a loser leave Southeastern stipulation, a handicap match. And for the first time that I can remember, the Mongolian stomper was wrestling twice in two different championship matches. Yeah, that's, you know, that, 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 that didn't happen very often. And, uh, and I don't know if you remember this, but a couple of TVs back, the great Mephisto, in a conversation with Charlie Platt, said his Mongolian stomper, uh, who was at that point one half of the Southeastern Tag Champions, <laughs> was fully capable 
of holding two titles at the same time. And he said to Charlie, and maybe even three. So he, he had the possibility of getting to this point if he won this match, this match with uh, Bob Armstrong. Vaguely, however vaguely, I do recall that. I think he said that on the TV show two weeks ago, the TV show, in which his Mongolian stomper won the TV championship and trophy from Kevin Sullivan. So if the Mongolian stomper kept his Southeastern tag belt and won this upcoming match with Bob Armstrong, now that one was for the Southeastern belt, he would hold all three Southeastern titles, the single, the tag, and the TV championship. How about that? Wow. I mean... Uh, you, that's all I can say is, wow, you know, man, <laughs> no one had ever done that in the five years southeastern uh, Tennessee history in that territory or nor the two years of the southeastern Gulf Coast territory. Uh, obviously, it was going to take a remarkable human being to be able to accomplish that. And speaking of a remarkable human being, I, that just brought a thought to my mind about my two sons and I. And uh, we, we were at the gym in Knoxville. It was in 1988, USA Wrestling. Uh, we were doing USA Wrestling at that point. And, uh, and uh, I was running that company. And uh, Gordon Soley was doing the television program. Um, but I wasn't wrestling any longer. I was uh, as a commentator on that show. And uh, so my two sons and I, we went to the gym in Knoxville one day. And we were downstairs in the freeway part of this huge gym. And uh, my boy spotted the Mongolian stomper. And he was upstairs on the second floor above us. Mm. And he was on the stair step machine. Mm. Uh, and when he when they pointed him out to me, uh, he was already drenched in sweat, man. And he was wearing that machine out. He wasn't cramped, walking like a like an old lady would on the stair step machine. He was cranking that son of a gun. Man. <laughs> and, uh, you know, from looking at him, I, he couldn't tell how long he'd been there, but uh, he was already sweaty and he was just, he was kicking its butt. And so, so I'd been told, uh, you know, the, the first time that I ever met Archie Goldie, who was the Mongolian stomping, or his real name was Archie Goldie, that, uh, that he was much older than he looked. Probably because, you know, he was always in tremendous shape. He mm -hmm. kept himself in such shape. Mm -hmm. He looked really young. So when he came to work for me, the first time in Knoxville in 76, I'd been told about it, how young he was, how old he was compared to the way he looked. So I just asked him flat out, I said, how old are you, man? And, uh, and he said, uh, you know, uh, he said, I'm 40 years old. Mm -hmm. But I looked at him. He didn't look like he was 20. You know, so I said, uh, show me your driver's license. I, I wanted him to confirm it, dude, that you're really 40 years old. <laughs> and uh, so he did. He handed me his driver's license, and there it was, man. He was 40 years old. So on this day in the gym, uh, you know, we had this conversation in 76. We're talking about 12 years later after he showed me his driver's license, and he was 40. So he's up there cranking away. He's 52 years old. Wow. So my boys and I were in the gym for a good hour, you know, and, uh, and I had a hard time keeping their attention because they couldn't take their eyes off a stomper up there, you know, and, and mm -hmm. they were like, God, he's still, look, daddy's grinding away, still going, you know, and, uh, and he just was, at top, he had that machine going at top speed, and uh, he was still there when we left the gym an hour later. He's wow. still going. When it comes to the stair stepper, if you know, you know. I have never been on a machine that takes more out of you, and it is incredible because, like, in some cases, they'll say, all right, you warm up on the, the stair stepper, and then we'll get your workout started. Are you kidding? Uh, so how long is a warm-up? Like five or six minutes, and I'm like, I think that was the workout. But that that's amazing. The, that machine, it ain't playing, I'm telling you. All right, I hate to ask, but that all right, that's a true story, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a true story, <laughs> man. Yeah. All right, so anyway, that is amazing. So he's still at it at 52 years old, and I know that's went been a while back. That's an amazing story. Wow. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, it's definitely a, a real story, man, and it took place, uh, like I said, nine years now after the cart mm -hmm. that we're discussing today. So <laughs> wow. this 
Yeah, wow. I mean, this, <laughs> and he's read, this thing, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you know, this is a 1979. Nine years later, he's cranking away up there. Amazing, amazing guy. So there was no doubt in my mind, man, if anyone was ever going to be able to win all three Southeastern titles, the single, the tag, and the TV, it was probably going to be that guy. Wow. The tidbits like that, the behind the scenes stuff that we would never hear about otherwise, that's what makes that's what makes the studcast great. All right, this tops off a really great first part of this studcast. When we come back after the break, we're gonna get into what I believe has to be a tremendous TV show to promote this December fifth, nineteen seventy nine card. That is coming up when this studcast continues. All right, Studcast fans, Ron Fuller, the Tennessee Stud, says you can do your Christmas shopping right now on his website, tnstud.com, tnstud.com. That's where you find the Stud store. You'll find his black and blue t-shirts all on sale for an unbelievable Christmas special of only $15.99 per shirt. You'll find four different 8x10 photos of Ron and the masked Tennessee Stud, only $15 each, personally autographed by him his unforgettable best-selling lion novel brutus would make a tremendous and treasured gift for any fan 1999 for the book only 29.99 personally autographed copy with a note to the person receiving it from the stud himself you got to check it out all items free shipping and we'll get there before christmas if you order by december 15th got to check it out tnstud.com all right, Studcast fans, welcome back in. Second half of this Studcast. This is, and it's a good one, number 327. That's this one. It's called Sullivan Gone. Terrible, terrible year ends soon. So, what an interesting first part of this Studcast that we've had. I've been eager to get to this TV show that you mentioned earlier, Rod. It sounded great, especially the 20 man tug of war. With Joe LaDuc, everything outside of the TV studio. I want, tell us about that one. And did that appear on the uh, in the other TV markets? I'm curious about that also. Oh, yeah. And it certainly did. And, uh, uh, you know, and I was there. But, uh, you know, I wasn't at this TV. Uh, I was still in Knoxville. Hadn't made the move yet. But the TV opened with uh, Jimmy Golden and Norvell Austin. Uh Norvell had won the United States Junior Championship belt, and he had it with him at the set with Charlie. And they watched the video of uh, Rob getting knocked out by Jimmy in their recent boxing match, which had been the week before. And it showed Norvell come down to the ring during the, the rest period after the fifth round of this boxing match, and he brought a bucket of water with him, and he put it in Jimmy's corner. And then instead, he, he, he wanted to get in the ring, got up on the apron, and he started to get in the ring, and the referee says, no, you know, uh, Rob don't have, a, he don't have anybody in his corner, you know. So, uh, so Austin, uh, you know, he just kept uh, staying there, and he kept uh, my attention on him. He kept uh, the referee's attention on him. And uh, while we weren't, uh, while, you know, where Rob, while Rob wasn't paying attention and couldn't uh, see what was going on, Jimmy's over there soaking his right hand glove in that bucket of water, man. So when the bell rang after the two minute break for the next round, uh, Golden took advantage of the fact that Rob was still had his attention on Norvell, and he uh, hit him with that right hand, man, and uh, with soaked glove, and uh, wow, knocked him out. And uh, so both Golden and Austin watched this, and they had a huge laugh, man. Uh, but the studio audience, they had a little different opinion of it, obviously. Yeah, I bet. Okay, all right, settle this for me real quickly. The the, the reason that he would soak the glove is because the glove is suddenly going to be a whole lot heavier, right? Oh, yeah, man. I mean, there's a, there's a world of difference between getting rid with a dry glove and one that's been soaked in water. Wow, it's like twice as it's like getting a clubbed upside the head with a with a baseball bat. Wow. Wow. So if the glove weighed four pounds, it probably immediately now weighs 10 or 12 pounds. Oh, yeah. Or it felt God. like. God. All right. So how about the first TV match? Who was in that? Jimmy Golden's uh, next opponent, uh, you know, my brother was in, in, in the very next match. And uh, 
studio audience was pretty glad to see him after Golden and Austin's little opening there. And then uh, Bob Armstrong told me later, uh, Rob got a good win uh, with a fuller leg lock. And then Rob went to the set with Charlie. And, uh, and then he had him put up uh, the first video uh, that of the boxing match. You know, he said, uh, let's put that video back up of the boxing match, you know, because uh, people probably weren't paying attention to what was going on because he wasn't either, right? And he said, the one you just shown when, Gold, when Golden and Austin were out here. And so Charlie had him put it up and, uh, and it showed Norbell. It went back and showed Norbell coming to the ring and left the bucket in the corner. And then when the video got started, Rob pointed out to everybody while he and the referee were kind of engaged there, uh, di- uh, messing around with Austin. He said, uh, you could clearly see in the video in the background, Jimmy soaking the glove. He's got the glove down in the bucket, right? <laughs> so Rob wanted to make sure everybody knew that's why he got knocked out so easy. He says, you know, and then he hit me with that soap, that soap boxing glove. Wow. So the studio crowd, they, they kind of liked that little bit of detective work. And uh, and they let Rob know his little day. Hey, that's pretty cool. And then, uh, but he wasn't through yet. He said, he's, he was really going to make the fans happy. So he asked the director, uh, uh, to stop the video and uh, and to get the next one up. So Rob had been up there and taken a video earlier in the earlier in the day, and he reminded Charlie and the fans that last week during the personality profile, Golden and Austin had shown a video of him with his head shaved bald, and you know after he he had lost a hair versus hair match with Jimmy, he got basically cheated by by uh, Austin and Golden, Mm because Austin got involved and helped Golden (laughs) win. And, uh, you know, and and he told the fans, this happened to me in Tennessee last summer. And, uh, you know, and then he says, you know, now now since uh, Jimmy's been out here and he's shown that video, he said, "Uh, I want to show everybody what Jimmy Golden looked like two weeks before then. (laughs) (laughs) And so so then he said, there was another hair versus hair match, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and he goes, you know, and then, you know, he says, well, let's take a look at that one. So then Charlie asked Wayne Reddish, who was the director, to roll the video, and it opened up uh, with me holding Jimmy. Jimmy had lost, and he was struggling trying to get away, and Rob was cutting his hair. And it continued until Golden was bald. <laughs> we shaved his head. <laughs> and the studio audience went crazy over that one. And, and so did Jimmy Golden. He's back in the dressing room. Why, now they've seen me with a bald head. So he came storming out of the dressing room, and Norvell's following along behind him. And uh, so so Rob saw him coming, and he, he Charlie said he just kind of left the set, went to the dressing room before they got to the set. And, uh, and so Golden was screaming at Charlie to stop that video, stop the video. His video was still on with his bald head. And then <laughs> so the studio crowd, they continued to celebrate, man. It's Charlie and Charlie even had a big laugh of its own. <laughs> and uh, then he threw it to, to the break. So, uh, <laughs> well, Rob's got a little bit of a, a little bit of a vendetta going here and a, and I guess he's having a good time at this point. Uh, it's a lot of fun right there. That's a great way to open the show. I can just hear the crowd and see Jimmy Golden just screaming at Charlie Platt as they went to black. Fade to black. Fade to black. All right. So if I'm if I'm correct, Stud, that was the second piece of video from Tennessee. And I want to ask you about that and what a major impact that had on the upcoming no disqualification, no disqualification match between Robert and Golden. So d- did you guys in Knoxville, did you record on video every TV show at the time? Yeah, yeah we recorded, uh, you know, and uh, we recorded those matches live and then we've s- inserted them into the television shows. All right. Did you so, did you own the tapes? Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, we, we, you know, the TV station, the, the deal was with the TV station is uh, we got uh eight minutes of commercials and they got yeah. eight minutes of commercials. We use those, those days, uh, but the shows belong to me. They belong to the Southeastern company. All right. So, so, uh, so when you left Knoxville, did you have a copy of every show then or, or did, like at the end of each show, did they within a week or so give you a copy of the show? How did yeah. that, how'd that work? 
Yeah, well, we 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 uh, bicycle those shows around to about five distant stations. So you would produce the show on one Saturday, the next Saturday it'd show in Johnson City, the next Saturday they'd show in Hazard, Kentucky, the next Saturday they'd show in Crossville, Tennessee. Then mm-hmm. they would come back to Knoxville. When they came back into Knoxville, uh, you, they, you you put them up, put some of them on a shelf. But what we had done is we knew which ones we wanted to have. So we went in and found the shows that these were on, yeah. and we just pulled off the pieces of the shows. Yeah. This, so, this match, for instance, Rob being bald, yep. Jimmy being bald, we're going to have a bunch of them coming. Uh, that we're sitting there waiting on uh, till we get these cards booked with certain guys against each other. Yeah. Then we're going to show these things. Uh, down there in the southeastern Gulf Coast territory. I get it now. Where they've never been seen. It's like you took pivotal big moments that happened there w- that happened to Robert or to Jimmy or to somebody that you knew was going to be headed south with you. you took angles that were angles. really good. Yeah. We went and pulled the videos that went with those angles, and we then showed them to the people in the south. And you had another angle to build from. Yes. That's awesome. That is cool. And that, listen, that's, that's to me, that's what made your TV and your TV production exceptional. You were always thinking about next week, next week, next week, the week after that. And you always, it's always a a great way to have an ace in the hole. And so I, that, that's really smart to do that. And that's a, that's a fun way to, to start new angles and keep it original. That's cool. All right. So who was on next? Well, the studio man exploded when this next guy showed up, and uh, it was the wrestling pro. And Leon Baxter, the entered man, he went <laughs> right straight to the set with Charlie. And uh, he and Charlie discussed the sudden appearance of this, uh, the, the, who uh, Leon called uh, the so-called super pro. I think that's the way he called, mm-hmm. what he called mm-hmm. him. And he said, he said, I saw what happened on the end of the show last week. And he goes, uh, you know, uh, I'm here, man, to, uh, you know, I got a little special video of my own, he says, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. So, so what had happened is he had gone to Mobile the week before to, to be face-to-face with this super pro, right? So, uh, so he had a piece of video that was shot four days earlier from Mobile. When he just showed up, he wasn't booked on the card or anything. He showed up in Mobile to confront the super pro. So the video showed the super pro getting a win over Roy Lee Welch. And then it showed the wrestling pro who was dressed in his wrestling gear. He was standing on the floor and he was in the super pro standing on the floor in the super pro's corner waiting for him to get out of the ring. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, I went to get him basically. Right. So the video showed the, the wrestling pro, uh, as soon as the wrestling you know, as soon, soon as the super pro saw him, <laughs> he froze, man. Like, oh gosh, what's he doing here, right? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, wrestling pro jumped up in the ring and went for him. And super pro jumped out and he ran to the dressing room. <laughs> I mean, the crowd went crazy in the building. They were like, wow. And the pro went down to the we went back there, but he wasn't going to get in the dressing room. They just they locked the door so that he couldn't get in there. But, uh, you know, so Wrestling Pro had his little spot in this television show for sure. Wow. I'm I'm curious. And, you know, I was a big fan of his. I mean, even as a kid, uh, I thought this guy was just terrific. Uh, Leon Baxter, the the Wrestling Pro, he's he's, uh, since left. How did you rate him as far as being on the microphone? I don't recall him doing a lot of interviews, a lot of promos, but I, I thought he was pretty good back then. Oh yeah, he was really good, and and not only that, he was a great wrestler, man. Uh, you know, a, a real uh, technician, yeah. Yeah, a real, real technician. He was he was one of the best. Um, so, uh, you no, know, so the the you know there there we had some we had some great videos, I think, in this particular uh, TV. Once Rob was telling me about it and explaining it, I was like, "Wow, man, you got some good stuff going here." <laughs> so the wrestler, you know, I just basically run to the video, run to the dressing room, and the in the last video, and that was the super pro, and the, and the wrestling pro uh, saw who it was, you know, and uh, and he asked Charlie if he could stay at the set, you know. 
that was the next guy in the ring. The super pro comes right in the ring. Uh, instead, I think the fans thought the wrestling pro was going to be wrestling, but the super pro was in the ring. So the wrestling pro asked Charlie, he said, can I stay here with you at the set? You know, and he says, he goes, he says, I'm not finished with this guy, right? So Rob said the super pro was a, really a heck of a wrestler, you know, and, uh, and that was pretty surprising. He was running all the time, you know, but it didn't, didn't look like he was going to be that tough. And, uh, and Rob said in this match, he showed some really great wrestling moves. And then he said he clotheslined the guy, man, on the end of the match. He said, I thought he took his head off, man. He was like, wow, this guy's good. Hmm. And then when the wrestling pro left the set, uh, you know, as soon as the, the, the super pro got his win, the wrestling pro went for him, man. He went straight to the ring, shot up into the ring, and, and uh, wrestling the super pro, uh, boy, uh, he, he just hit the floor again. Ran into the dressing room and locked the door. <laughs> this is I love this. This is getting crazy. It's been two weeks since the Super Pro arrived on the scene, challenging the one and only wrestling pro, but he's been doing nothing but running away from him the entire time. So they're both on that upcoming mobile car, but not against each other. I know fans were going to be watching those matches pretty closely because of that rivalry. All right, was the Joe LaDuke profile next? I can't wait to hear how LaDuke will handle 20 men trying to pull his hands apart. I guess you would say in a human tug of war. Oh, man, uh, this is uh, this is going to be uh, – fans have talked about this one for a long time. And, yeah, it was next, man. And, uh, obviously, it had to be pre-recorded before the TV show was shot. And uh, – so, uh, you know, and, and we had to do it outside. You can't get 20 guys in the studio, uh, you know, pulling up, trying to, to break a guy's hand grip, you know. So 20, what happened is, is when the people came in before the show ever started, uh, we went out there and selected, uh, selected, I think Charlie selected the guys and he selected uh, 20 men from that were in the studio crowd. And he said, would y'all like to be in this? And he got 20 guys that wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And then Charlie took uh, Joe LaDuke and uh, two handheld cameramen went out there, the two cameramen who, who had handheld cameras. And, uh, and then uh, all these 20 guys and then just about everybody in the studio went out too, right? I mm -hmm. mean, like, what the heck? Let's go watch it ourselves. So it, this whole little segment kind of opened up with Charlie and LaDuke. Uh, and Joe was showing Charlie these two leather arm straps uh, with ropes attached to each one of them. Yep. And, uh, the 10 men were selected, had been selected, and they, and they decided which 10 was going to be on this rope, which 10 was going to be on the other. And then Joe LaDuke, uh, proving, man, that he was a good guy, uh, before this started, he went down the line of every one of those men. He introduced himself and thanked each one of them for helping him do this demonstration before it even began. A real gentleman. Yeah. A real gentleman. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so then Charlie put the straps around Joe's massive arms. God, Joe had massive arms. And, uh, you know, that strap went from back to shoulder down to almost to the elbow. And, uh, and then he had all the 20 men, uh, get on the ropes on each side of his body. And then, uh, Charlie told the guys, uh, all of the contestants. And he said, you know, uh, he had a whistle, and he said, when I sound this whistle, he goes, uh, y'all start pull, and uh, you've got 20 seconds to pull Joe's hands apart. Uh, but, uh, do you know, and he said, but, uh, you know, if you can't pull his hands apart, I'm 20 seconds later, I'm going to blow the whistle again if Joe, if Joe can hold on that long. So then Rob, Bob, and all the baby faces came out of their dressing room, too, on the outside. They wanted mm -hmm. to watch, too. And uh, Rob said the studio crowd was all out there with him, you know, uh, said pretty close to the, the, what's going on, right? So, so then uh, Joe grasped his, his big, huge hands he had, man. Uh, he grasped his hands together, and Charlie blew the whistle. And the 20 men uh, just started pulling, and Joe was, like, straining like crazy, man. Uh, you know, all, all his might, and his face was blood red, and, 
and uh, and he was moving back and forth. They were tugging him one way and tugging him another. He almost went off his feet a couple of times, but he held that for the whole 20 seconds. When the 20 second whistle sounded, mm. uh, Joe's hands were still together, obviously. And uh, Bob was telling me how this went. And he said, Ron, when, when Joe, when the whistle sounded and Joe had done the deal, he said the studio pop crowd, the crowd popped. They're out there watching it. They popped. And he said, not only that, he said the 20 guys that were participating that had been on the ropes, he said they all just ran and surrounded Joe congratulating him. And they were blown away too. <laughs> How did he do that, right? You know, and then and then here came the studio crowd. They came out and got in it too. Well, they're filming all this on these handheld cameras, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, the studio crowd and all of the, the, the guys, the contestants, uh, they were all involved. In, and uh, Bob and Rob had seen this done. I'd seen it done, too, in Knoxville. We had done it in Knoxville in 1977 when Joe came into the territory. But uh, Bob and Rob told me, he said, they, it was more impressive, Ron, than when they did it in Knoxville. He said it even <laughs> Wow. Uh, listen, that's that's awesome. I can't believe I was not watching that day. It sounds like a remarkable feat of strength. I know all the studio fans had to be impressed with that, and I'm pretty sure those watching from home were astounded as well. Uh, and and uh, obviously later when it played back, right? Well, yeah, when done in Knoxville, you know. Uh, uh, when we did it in Knoxville, it was the talk of the town. You know, mm-hmm. and and uh, and the same thing happened along the Gulf Coast after this, man. Uh, and to me, this had as much impact uh, in in getting Joe over as probably twenty wins on television. So plus, plus instantly, man, it set one of the least likely baby faces to ever get over in a territory, you right? Joe Duke is certainly not your normal looking baby face. It set Joe Duke on fire. It had been fantastic. And, uh, we had another feat of strength coming. Wow. How can you top? How can he top that? I, I don't know how anything can follow that. All right. What was next on the TV show? Well, the Southeastern tag champions, the Mongolians, uh, with their tag belts and the Mongolian stomper, with his TV trophy, who was managed by the great Mephisto, uh, they went to the set with Charlie. And they watched their win over Kevin Sullivan and Jerry Stubbs four days earlier uh, in Mobile. And uh, and that was leading, obviously, to another title match. And this one was going to be uh, loser leaves the fall. The loser of the fall has got to leave Southeastern. So this one is going to be a heck of a lot more important than any of the others that they had had. Okay, so how about the next live TV match? That was Kevin Sullivan and Jerry Stubbs, man. They'd just been seen on video, and those two guys were really over at this point, man. And according to Bob, uh, they got themselves a really big win, man. And uh, so the this upcoming Loser of the Fall Leaves match was going to mean a whole lot to the fans. Uh, they really loved these team, this team, and, uh, and uh, you know, if one of the Mongols is gone, then that team's basically gone too. Mm-hmm. I see I, exactly what you mean. Exactly. All right. So I'm not sure where we are in time on this, but what was the last thing on that TV? Well, it was Bob Armstrong, man, coming to the set uh, with his belt. And uh, he watched his victory over Tora Tanaka from, from the Mobile show four days earlier. And, uh, Tanaka, it was a loser leave match. Tanaka was gone from the Southeastern. Uh, and I don't think Tanaka ever came back to Southeastern, as a matter of fact. And uh, wow, nobody was over better than Bob was, man. Uh, after he finished watching his win over Tanaka, he had a few words to say about his next opponent. Uh, and he I'm talking about the Mongolian Stomper, who was coming after his belt. And, uh, and he told Charlie, he said, I can't tell you, Charlie, how much respect he goes. I got f- for any man, you know, like, like st- the stomper here that's going to do what the stomper is going to try to do. He's going to wrestle twice in one night, and it's going to be in back-to-back matches. He goes, <laughs> you know, who can do that, right? And, uh, and then he knew, you know, and he says, I know. I got my work cut out for me. This guy's a monster. Wow. Wow. 
All right. All right. What about the last TV match? Oh, man, uh, what we're going to do, we, 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 we had to stomp her himself. You know, it was the end of the end of the end of the TV show and the studio. You know, they uh, they had uh, they'd they'd had quite a day already. They'd been outside. They'd seen all this thing outside. They come back in and they're waiting on the last match. And uh, boy, here comes the Southeastern Tag Champion and the TV champion, the Mongolian Stomper, uh, wearing his tag belt. But uh, he's got Mephisto carrying the TV trophy so that you know what he's going to do so that he can head for the fans, man. And wow, the (laughs) fans saw him coming and they headed for the exit. So, so Rob said the studio was still half empty when the Stomper won the match five minutes later, right? He said the fans didn't, a lot of them didn't even come back. They were afraid to even come back to the studio. Okay, what a powerful TV show. Great matches, great videos, and a real powerhouse in the middle of all of it. So break it down for us. What happened in Mobile on Wednesday night, December 5th, 1979? Well, Rob told me that the wrestling pro got a fantastic reception from the crowd. And uh, he and Roy Lee Welch had a great babyface match uh, where the pro uh, ended up putting Roy to sleep at the end of the match. But uh, then he woke him up and they both uh, got, a, you know, Roy got up and, uh, and shook hands with the pro. And uh, Rob said they got a standing ovation in the first match of the night. Now, that's a great thing in any night. Uh, And uh, that's what it used to be like, man, way back in the day. And it was a sign that, uh, you know, Mobile was such a great wrestling city. Fans appreciated a good, clean wrestling match. So Rob said the the big thrill came for him, though, in the second match. He said the week before, Joe LaDuke had wrestled Troy Graham. And practically nobody cheered for Joe, right? Mm-hmm. So this time, all the fans now had seen this tug of war already, you know, with Joe. And uh, and Rob said, as soon as Joe left the dressing room to go to the ring, he said the fans mobbed him, man, on the way to the ring. He said Joe was smiling like a politician. I think that's the way he put it. When he finally got to the ring, man, he said it took Joe five minutes to get to the ring hmm. because the fans were just uh, in the highway and just so, you know, he was an overnight sensation. So so Joe was wrestling in his first Southeastern handicap match that night against the Super Pro that uh, had already been confronted on TV by the wrestling pro and Troy Graham again. So the wrestling pro came down to the ring uh after Joe got there, you know, and they had a little conversation with Joe. Uh, you know, that's what Rob said that, you know, uh, he, him and Joe kind of got their heads together. And uh, and he, you know, he pointed to go over there. There stands the super pro. And, you know, Rob said, well, he's telling me, you know, I mean, he was telling him that I'm, I'm here to I'm here to get my hands on that guy over there. So uh, Joe said, well, just stay here. Stay on the floor in the corner by in my corner here. You know, because I want to see it, too. So match didn't last long, Rob said, you know, because the Super Pro never even got in the ring. He said that uh, Graham started the match, and the first time uh, he tried to tag the Super Pro, he said the masked man jumped off the apron and he ran to the dressing room. The wrestling pro chased him all the way. (laughs) And uh, Joe obviously finished with Troy Graham pretty quickly after that, but – uh. Well, the wrestling pro, uh, we got something going here. Oh, no doubt. All right, so when was the wrestling pro going to get his hands on the super pro? I can't wait for that. Well, that was the idea behind the angle, man. I mean, uh, (laughs) when everybody starts asking the question, uh, when is this guy going to get his hands on him? You really got something going then, you know. So Robert and Jimmy, you know, they were in the next match. Uh, It was a no disqualification match. And uh, this had become a pretty heated rivalry between Rob and Jimmy. And uh, Rob ended up bleeding in this one, and uh, but he was on the edge of victory. He had golden pin, and uh, here comes Norvell. And uh, he arrived down there ringside, and uh, it's a no disqualification match. Mm-hmm. So he just reached in, and he grabbed Rob by a foot, and he drug him off of Jimmy, not only off of Jimmy, but all the way out onto the floor. 
So uh, since it was an ODQ match, the referee couldn't stop it. So uh, Rob started fighting uh, with Norvell out on the floor. And uh, Golden got up and he pulled uh, something out of his trunks. And uh, he just took his time and eased out on the floor behind Rob. And by that point, Rob was on top of Norvell. He had him down on the floor and uh, he was nailing him. And, uh, and uh, Jimmy hit him. Jimmy hit Rob. And, uh, <laughs> and then... Uh, Jimmy and Norvell grabbed Rob. They threw him back in the ring. Jimmy crawled in and covered him, and the ref had no choice. He counted him out. So the next match was for the United States Junior Heavyweight Championship. Uh, the champion, Norvell Austin, versus the former champion, Tony Charles. And it, too, like the Fuller Golden match, was a no disqualification match. And it had almost an identical ending, same ending to it. Uh, Tony Charles was uh, fighting uh, both Austin and Golden on the floor at the end of it, and uh, he got beat, and uh, they threw him back into the ring, and, uh, and, you know, Austin went in and covered him, and, you know, no disqualification match. He got counted out. So in the, in the Southeastern Tag Championship match, the champions, uh, the Mongolians, managed by the great Mephisto, beat Kevin Sullivan in the match. And into Kevin's long run, man, in both southeastern territories, he not had a, he had a long, an even a much longer run in the Tennessee territory than he did in the uh, in the uh, Gulf Coast. But uh, and he wasn't going to be back in Pensacola for almost six years. Hmm. Uh, but by then, when he comes back, southeastern had already become continental championship wrestling. And uh, Kevin wasn't going to come back as a as a big, big baby face. <laughs> he was going to end up being one of the most hated heels. And he had two of the most fearsome athletes, the New Guinea Headhunters, he called. <laughs> uh, wow. I mean, he was going to create havoc, man. So <laughs> last of the three main events, saw the Mongolian Stomper get disqualified in his quest for Bob Armstrong's southeastern belt. Uh, he didn't get the belt, uh, but, uh, you know, he didn't lose. He lost, uh, but only because uh, he was staying on Bob. Evidently, he could go two matches back-to-back. Man, that's a great night of action right there. So what about attendances in those three major markets? Well, they held up pretty good considering the time of year it was. You know, I explained, you know, we're between Thanksgiving and Christmas and in, uh, in the month of December. Uh, the Montgomery's crowd went down from about 3,000 to about 2,500. Uh, Dothan went from uh, 4,200 to 3,700. And Dothan went from 45, I mean, Montgomery, uh, Mobile, from 4,500 to 3,900, almost 4,000 still. Uh, and it was still more than 10,000 in those three cities. And, and basically, the worst time of the year, I mean, obviously, everybody had a hard time in these four weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Oh, no doubt. I tell you what, this has been another great one, and we still, can you believe it? We will have enough time for a learning tree question. All right, Rodney Minton from Dothan, Alabama, ask, when Dick Dunn and Leon Baxter came to Knoxville in 1976, whose idea was it to put them under a mask and call them superstars? (laughs) <laughs> that's a good question uh, uh, that was my idea Rodney <laughs> <laughs> I knew that I knew it <laughs> <laughs> I mean uh, I was in the second year of my first wrestling territory my first southeastern wrestling territory in Knoxville and, and I hadn't had very many mass men in the territory during that first two years and uh, and, uh, and I never had a mass tag team champions you know and uh and uh, those two guys made a marvelous tag team. Wow, were they unbelievable. And, you know, and, and I'm kind of happy, Rodney, that you chose to talk about these two wrestlers and this one, uh, you know, because I already spent a lot of time in this one talking about Leon, Leon, the wrestling pro. And uh, and uh, I spent some time talking about him in this stud cast already. So uh, both Leon Baxter and Dick Dunn, lived in the southeastern Gulf Coast Territory for years. I think, and you probably know more about this than I do, Dave, but I think Leon was either born there or lived there all his life in that Dothan area. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. And uh, and I think Dick Dunn 
they're very close to Dothan himself. Yes, yes. So, so you know, they, those guys were from right down there in the part of country that we've been talking about today. And one of the other reasons, though, that I chose to put them under mask is the fact that they had both wrestled under mask for most of their careers. Leon wrestled under a mask because he was a law officer and he didn't want people to know he wrestled. Right. You know, right. so he yeah. was kind of trying to hide his, his, his identity. Uh, Dick Dunn wrestled under the hood for many years as a partner with Don Carson. Uh, so all of those uh, names, uh, you know, should be familiar to you, Rodney, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you know, those guys very well. So, uh, so you yeah, asked why I chose to call them superstars. Well, it was because, uh, to me, uh, that was just what they were, superstars, man. And they had been superstars for most of their careers. Leon Baxter was trained by my dad in the late 1950s. Wow. Was a was a great shooter. My dad was very impressed with Leon Baxter. And uh, dad spent a lot of time with Leon and uh and and taught him how to shoot and uh and and leon was a feared man i can tell you that and i mm. guess you know it his reputation was pretty big time in, in that part mm. of the country well he so he was a wrestler before he was a sheriff's deputy i'm not sure which came first to be honest with you i bet i, I think that would be the case yeah. though i, I, I I'm think just, it probably could have happened yeah, that way yeah, yeah. yes wow okay yeah, and then he wore, wore the mask because he didn't want to, you know, uh, hey, people to see. He, he didn't think it was appropriate, I guess, to be a policeman and a wrestler. Right, right, right. right. People, so, uh, you yeah. know, so my dad taught it <laughs> Leon to shoot, and he was a great shooter, and he was he was a feared guy. And Dick Dunn was not a shooter, but he was one of the best wrestlers in the history of the business. He was so talented. So in a... So, and then, you know, I, I give them a lot of credit for, for both those guys for getting my Tennessee territory off the ground. I mean, I, I was struggling about those first two years, and, and I got these guys in there, and, mm -hmm. and wow, we did one of the best angles with those two guys that, that we ever did there, man. And, and the wow. angle was a shoot. Uh, and Ron Wright was the top baby face in the territory, and, uh, and when they had a problem with him, uh, they put a bounty out on them, right? And the bounty was uh, they would pay $500 to anybody, anybody, not just a wrestler, anybody, anywhere that could bust either one of Ron Wright's eyes. They got $500. So, so wow. Ron, Ron Wright being the tough old son of a gun, he was, man. Uh, he let them, uh, both these guys, uh, Dunn, and, <laughs> Dunn and Baxter, he let him uh, bust him uh, uh, over over a one month period of time. He let him bust both his eyes hard way, <laughs> meaning wow. meaning wow. that they they really busted his eyes and he he went to the hospital and he had to get sewn up both times. Right. Wow. So today's wrestlers uh, they they can't even imagine letting someone do that to one eye, much <laughs> less both of them. Right. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> So, so thanks for your question, Rodney, man. I hope I answered it to your satisfaction. Like, you, you want me to do what now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about Rodney, but you sure answered that question to my satisfaction, stud. When I started watching wrestling, I loved both of those guys. I mean, and they that's why they had so many fans. And I can't tell you, you, you said they wrestled together in Knoxville. As a kid, I never knew of a Knoxville and that wrestling took place there and not, especially not with the same guys. I saw those two, Dick Dunn and the wrestling pro in so many main event matches. To me, it was like, holy cow. And, and those were, those were big matches when they were the main event and a, a lot of, and I may have seen them wrestle as long as an hour in more than one match, but uh, they main evented a, a lot of those. That is awesome. All wrestling right. against each other. Basically, they're yes. wrestling against yes. each other. So, yes. you know, this is, this is, this is right. It's an amazing story here about these two territories that uh, you had those stars down there that came to Knoxville. 
they teamed up as a team rather than wrestle against each yeah. other, yeah. put on masks, and they they fired up a territory. Yeah. They because they have, were such great talents, both of those guys, and uh, and there you are down there had no idea. Probably no, didn't know no. that till till I just told the story. No. No, it was it was kind of rumored. Oh, I know who the wrestling pro is. He works for the sheriff's department, and then eventually, oh, I found out his name, uh, and that was that was a couple of years down the line as a kid to, to pick up on that. But then Dick Dunn was always introduced from Lowry, Alabama. I and for the life of me, I've never looked it up, so I'm not sure how far out that is. But listen, that's a great history lesson. A sharp visual review of the TV show, the matches in the arena, and best of all. Uh, you know something uh, about almost everyone that ever wrestled. I mentioned those tidbits you were mentioning earlier, and that's what makes these these unique. You've taken you've taken us on a wild ride that ended up with Ron Wright and two busted eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Only in a stud cast can you find that. All right, how about next week? How do you top it? Where do we ride next week, Ron? Well, man, uh, every stud cast now kind of brings us closer to 1980. Wow. We're going to finally get out of 1979, and the next one is going to finally uh, see the wrestling pro get his hands on the super pro. But uh, fans are going to find out that, that you know uh, that uh, there's a, there's there's more to the super pro than just the name. He's there is a little super in that pro. That's what the <laughs> deal is, right? <laughs> so uh, Joe LaDuke uh, is going to wrestle another handicap match. Uh, this time he's going to wrestle two masked men, uh, and. Uh, the popular Ricky Fields, uh, who the fans really loved him, especially in Mobile. That was his home. Uh, he was going to face off against Jimmy Golden. And the next one, uh, Robert Fuller is going to replace Kevin Sullivan uh, with Jerry Stubbs uh, and to be his partner. And they're going to try to conquer the Mongolians, which uh, nobody's been able to do at this point. And uh, Jimmy's not going to be interfering this next time <laughs> against Norville in the title defense because uh, – Jimmy's going to be barred from the building. <laughs> He's going to have to leave the building after his match. He's, they're going to throw him out of the building to make sure that uh, Tony's going to get a fair chance to win his belt back from Northern <laughs> Austin. And then uh, Bob Armstrong's going to be facing the Stomper again. But in an extremely rare Texas death match for the championship, you never, you don't normally have those matches for championships, but uh, this one's going to be that. And the Stomper is going to be trying to do what he wasn't able to do the week before. He's going to have that opportunity to win, to win the third belt, man. So, uh, plus, you know, uh, we're going to have another learning tree and much more. Hey, I tell you, the learning tree question that does it for me every time. I had heard the, I remember you talking on many studcasts ago about the wrestling pro and Dick Dunn, how they were in Knoxville. But then today, the, the story is just, just amazing how it, it really opened my eyes to, to what you were really saying then uh, as, uh, 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 versus now. And as a kid who really idolized these guys that were wrestling each other long ago here in the Dothan, Alabama area. All right, listen, folks, it's easy. You find Ron on Facebook at Ron Fuddle of the Tennessee Stud. Like him and follow him there and automatically become friends with a living legend. It's easy to do. It's the same on Twitter, now known as X also. On Twitter, find him at Ron Fuller Welch. Follow him there, too. Check out the fantastic website, tnstud.com. This stud cast is going to be there. With every stud cast ever done, you shop the stud store where you get 43 super stud casts. Four different 8x10 photos, the thrilling lion novel called Brutus, personally autographed to you even, and t-shirts on special right now for Christmas, only $15.99 for quality t-shirts, no less. Subscribe now at YouTube Southeastern Rewind and get the best in old school wrestling. Find 365 videos for you to peruse. The last 104 stud cast, 52 stud stories, 84 short rides with the stud, and now 11 ask the stud question and answer shows, all exclusively on YouTube. Look for Southeastern Rewind. It's the best deal in old school wrestling. All right. Any final comments, Ron? Well, I, I want to I hope everybody had a great, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, man, we just passed the Thanksgiving time frame and, uh, Thanks, obviously, to all our listeners uh, for, for 
for your support out there. Tell your friends and your neighbors about us and take care of yourselves and others and may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller of the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at David Summers Productions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud, LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic studcast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee Stud. One, two, three. This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.